Welcome back. Time now to take a deeper look at some of the Supreme Court's recent decisions. Last week, we told you about some of the most important rulings the court was expected to make. So tonight, we're going to talk about some of those decisions. In National Labor Relations Board versus Canning, the court was unanimous. The president cannot make recess appointments if the Senate says it's in session, even if the sessions only last a minute or two and don't involve any actual business. In McCullen versus Coakley, the court struck down a Massachusetts law that required no protest buffer zones around abortion clinics. And in Riley versus California, the justices were unanimous again, this time placing limits on the ability to search cell phones without a warrant by police, stating smartphones and other devices are not in the same category as wallets and briefcases. So for a deeper look, let's bring in Mark Furnish, who is a criminal defense attorney and professor at Brooklyn Law School. And let's welcome back Garrett Epps, who is a law professor at the University of Baltimore and the Supreme Court reporter for The Atlantic. He actually joined us last Sunday when he previewed, when we previewed the rulings of the Supreme Court. Good to have you with us, gentlemen. Thanks for having me, Tom. So let's start Great with you, Mr. Here. Epps. You were with us last Sunday for the week ahead. Were you surprised by any of the rulings? Uh, I was uh, surprised by the tone. Uh, I think what's what's striking is uh, the extent to which Chief Justice Roberts has managed to get um, all of the justices of the court, you know, into this. They're not all in the same pew, but they're getting into the same church. Uh, and the tone of the, uh, the the results in a number of these cases were unanimous, even though the reasoning was sharply split. It's a very different atmosphere than the court even a year ago. So we'll talk about the harmony more of the court coming up in just a little bit. So I want to start with the person's Noel Canning, Mr. Furnish. Well, you know, I think that all bets are off, Tom, when it's a highly politicized case, but I can't say that this result was uh, surprising in any way. Uh, to the degree there was a surprise, it was that all of the justices lined up against the president, and naturally Justice Scalia took the most extreme position against him given his literalist uh, reading of the appointments clause and other constitutional provisions. But it, it was really an expected ruling, I think. And Mr. Epps, this won't have an immediate impact, but it will with a shift of power. Well, if the Senate changes hands um, in, in the fall, you're going to see uh, a lot of these uh, questions become very relevant. Right now it's not that important because uh, after the recess appointments that were at stake in Noel Canning, uh, the Senate changed its rules so that you can't filibuster most executive nominations. But um, the issue is still there and what's striking is that the court really made only a very small cut uh, in the recess power that the Obama administration uh, had been claiming. Uh, you know, as Mark says, uh, Justice Scalia wanted to basically, he said, he said in his opinion, this, this, is, this power is an anachronism, we should just get rid of it. Um, and the court, uh, in an opinion by Justice Breyer, refused to do that. It was a very moderate result and not surprising for anyone who saw the argument. None of the justices thought that the administration had a good argument. So Mr. Furnish, beyond the president and his authority, what does this mean for the Labor Board? Do they have to re-examine their cases that well, they ruled on? Yeah, as I understand it, three new nominees have already been properly confirmed by the Senate, and you know, this is by no means my principal area of practice, but I understand that hundreds of rulings are perhaps in jeopardy and have to be re-examined. Uh, they could actually come out in a more liberal way, ironically, uh, than the nominees that were sort of submarine by the rulings uh, might have held. We'll see what's ahead. I want to talk about McCullen versus Coakley here. SCOTUS ruled unanimously that Massachusetts went too far, literally, Mr. Epps. Uh, that's right. Uh, it was a nine to nothing result, and five justices said basically 35 foot buffer zones on the sidewalk that restrict everyone passing by from speaking or interacting uh, is just too much. But what's striking is what they didn't do. They didn't overturn the court's earlier uh, precedent that said that, that uh, states could have buffer zone laws. And that was five justices on that opinion. Uh, four justices, again led by Justice Scalia, wanted to make a radical change in this law. They wanted to say that any buffer zone law was a First Amendment violation as a violation of the freedom of speech, which would have been a huge change in the law, and they fell one vote short. Most states have an 8 to 15 foot buffer zone. Do they give an exact number on how far is too far? No, they don't. And, and there's a lot of debate uh, in this community now about whether this opinion can be used to tackle some of these state laws or 
whether they're safe. The, the Chief Justice wrote, played his cards very close to the vest in his uh, opinion for the majority. Two questions for you, Mr. Furnish. Will this affect other buffer zones in states? Well, I think it could affect other buffer zones. I, I think the key uh, takeaway from the case is the vital distinction between expressive activity, which is constitutionally permissible on the one hand, mm -hmm. and obstructing entrances to clinics on the other. And, and I thought the court tellingly, tellingly, I should say, pointed to the, there's a federal statute that's a real paradigm for how to enact this type of law properly, the Federal Access to Clinics Act. And if states would just model their legislation after that model, they'd likely be sustained. Well, you bring up a good point. Is, was it more about free speech or was it about patient safety? Well, this is totally about free speech because these aren't conventional protesters. These are people who were going up to uh, people seeking abortion services and supposedly peacefully just speaking with them and trying to educate them about other alternatives. So it, the case pitted the classic liberal values of free expression on the one hand mm -hmm. versus abortion rights on the other and uh, free expression trumped. Utility Air versus EPA, Mr. Epps, was this a total victory for the EPA? Well, uh, this is the 83-86 case. Uh, in the opinion by Justice Scalia, he said that uh, the EPA had sought authority to rule 86 to regulate 86 percent uh, of the sources of greenhouse gases in the country and that the court's decision gave them the authority to uh, regulate 83 percent. So in that sense, uh, it, it is seen as a victory for the EPA. Um, they, they certainly didn't uh, lose most of what they were asking for. There's some troubling language in the opinion that leads some people to believe that we'll be back here in a mm -hmm. year or two uh, when the EPA actually issues its regulations because the court has suggested they'll take a very close look uh, at those regulations and some people have said the test they set up is going to be impossible for any regulation yeah, to really pass. trying to decipher those numbers you know one of the major cases still pending we want to talk about here is Harris versus Quinn it's one of the most important labor law decisions being made in fact Diane Estabrook spoke directly to Pamela Harris who sued the governor of Illinois a Medicaid program pays Pamela Harris to take care of her developmentally disabled son, Josh, at home. Under Illinois law, that makes her a state worker and eligible for union representation. But Harris wants no part of organized labor. They're overstepping. You don't belong in a house, a home. You don't belong intruding into a family. And you don't belong interfering in the care of an individual with significant disabilities. In a case that's wound its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, Harris sued Illinois Governor Pat Quinn over an executive order calling her a state employee and requiring her to pay fees to a union she didn't want to join. Paul Kersey from the Illinois Policy Institute thinks Harris's suit is a compelling one. If the union calls a strike, for instance, she's certainly not going to leave, uh, leave Josh uh, alone. So the union model for, what, for who she is and what she does just doesn't fit. Home health care is one of the few industries public employees unions have been successful organizing over the past few years. So the Supreme Court's decision will affect not only those workers here in Illinois, but workers in other states as well. If the court rules those workers can't be considered state employees or required to pay union fees, the Service Employees International Union could lose thousands of members and millions of dollars. Union spokesman James Muhammad argues unionizing home health care workers has helped them get higher wages and improve the industry. The main thing is that the things we have done not only help to stabilize the workforce, but to help raise standards across the board for the, the care that is delivered to people with disabilities. Kenny, you coming out? 81-year-old Flora Johnson receives Medicaid to care for her son, okay. Kenny, who has cerebral palsy. Johnson is a union member and says the money she gets has doubled in the last decade from over $5 an hour to just under 12. Before the union, Johnson felt she was powerless against Illinois' mm. Medicaid program. They could say, well, I'm going to pay you $2 an hour or a dollar an hour. We didn't have a voice. Still, Pamela Harris doesn't want the union telling her how to care for Josh or taking dues she feels could better be spent on her son's care. Diane Estabrook, Al Jazeera, Chicago. Mr. Epps, Harris versus Quinn, how do you see this case playing out? Well, uh, the stakes in this case are very, very high. 
Um, and it's important to make sure the record is clear. This isn't a case about uh, requiring union dues. Uh, this isn't a case in which the union wants to dictate how care is carried out. Uh, this is a case in which the union performs a service for the home health care workers of negotiating their wage rates and, and job conditions. Uh, and they don't require the members to join the union. They just uh, ask for what's called a fair share fee to pay for the cost of a grievance procedure, uh, a call center, and negotiating the contracts. Um, there are some condi uh, uh, conditions of home health care workers uh, that are unique, but it is quite clear and was quite clear in the briefs and oral argument that the National Right to Work uh, Federation, which is behind this case, is trying to do away with unionization in the public sector period. Uh, that they are hoping to get the court to rule that public employee unions uh, requiring fees from their members uh, violates the First Amendment. And they said, we basically, they said, we will be back to challenge more contracts if you give us what you want. So mm -hmm. this could be a very highly politicized decision. It's going to be probably be five to four one way or the other. Uh, if it if it goes against the union, it will be seen as the Republican majority on the court targeting a key part uh, of the Democratic base. I want to talk about the police ability, the right to search your cell phone with you, Mr. Furnish, in just a moment. But I want to talk about another case here, Mr. Epps, still awaiting a decision. It's Sibelius versus Hobby Lobby stores. It's being considered together with Conestoga Wood Specialties Corporation versus Sibelius. It considers whether for-profit companies have freedom of religious rights and it's likely to affect other challenges to the Affordable Health Care Act. This one will be decided tomorrow, correct? Yes. No, no, Monday. Monday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thinking it's Sunday in the week ahead here. How do you see this one playing yeah. out? You scared me. <laughs> um, this, this is unpredictable. I, I think if you were putting money down, you would bet that there will be some kind of victory for Hobby Lobby stores. But the question is how broad will it be? There some, were some hints at the argument that the Chief Justice, who is very attuned to the need of, uh, needs of corporations and corporate interests, that he wanted to decide only that wholly family-owned companies might be able to use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, uh, to claim exemptions from the contraception mandate. What's really striking in this case is that the, the big corporate uh, interests and their uh, groups that litigate, like the Amer U.S. Chamber of Commerce, have not come in on the side of Hobby Lobby because uh, if the court were to decide in broad terms that for-profit corporations can have a religion, uh, then all of a sudden uh, companies like Walmart are mm -hmm. going to be under a lot of pressure from customers and others to adopt and say we're a Christian company or, or we are this denominational company. At the same time, they're trying to open stores in China and Abu Dhabi and so forth. So the court, uh, if it wants to hold for uh, Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood, has to walk a very narrow path uh, if they want to avoid making the situation much, much worse. And there are 40 plus similar cases pending. I want to talk about Riley versus California here, Mr. Furness. Was this a watershed moment for the digital rights movement? police ability to search your cell phone? Well, I certainly think it's the most significant decision on criminal procedure in the digital age in the last decade, at least. Revolutionary moment, we don't know. Its implications for other forms of technologies are kind of broad, but the holding itself is kind of narrow. It just uh, requires police to get a warrant before conducting the search of an arrested suspect's cell phone. Now, that's a relatively easy proposition to get a warrant. Uh, it just says that they can't do it automatically. What's really significant about the decision is it recognizes categorically mm -hmm. that digital devices don't have any physical analogs in the real world or in, and are entitled to much greater protection because of the quantity and quality of the information that they store. Are you surprised by the decision? Uh, maybe surprised a little bit by the fact that it was uh, nine nothing, mm -hmm. but it was a ringing endorsement um, and the fact that it's written by the chief justices uh, the Chief Justice, I should say, with all nine behind him, gives it added heft. Let's talk about Ario, Ario versus American Broadcasting Companies here. Mr. Epps, a big loss for Ario. What does this mean for the company? It's a major victory for the broadcasting companies. Well, I assume that Ario is going to have to make a licensing agreement with the broadcast companies or go out of business. And as of 1130 this morning, mm -hmm. the company said it was suspending operations to its consumers. Um, as far as the larger implications, those are 
hard to see because in the technological area, the court by necessity is kind of like Harry Truman's Goonie bird that flies backward and can only see where it's been and not where it's going. So that by the time they really finish grappling with all the implications of the aerial technology, we're going to be on to something else yeah. uh, anyway. So uh, it, it's, it, it decided only one issue in a multi-issue lawsuit, uh, and it's not clear how broad the implications are going to be. This brings up a good point. What does this mean for new forms of digital media, Mr. Furnish? Well, I think it signals that uh, the court is going to not get into the weeds of the minutia of how the technology works and f will focus instead on its functional effect. And this is uh, classic Breyer. Uh, if it smells like cable TV, then it is cable TV, and it's going to be regulated in the same way. Uh, so it, it's funny. In the cell phone case, Roberts spoke with uh, much more uh, proficiency about the technological nuances of cell phones, maybe because they're so much more prevalent, whereas in, in the Arrow case, they sort of swept over the distinctions between cable TV and what Arrow is actually providing. And uh, that was one of the reasons why Scalia sort of blasted the uh, Breyer majority opinion. I want to get your final thoughts on the court. The harmony in the high court, as we talked about, among the dysfunction, if you will, in Washington. We actually saw a united Supreme Court this session, Mr. Epps. Well, the Chief Justice, when he became Chief Justice, he said he wanted to foster a culture where unanimous opinions would become more the norm and the group is all in it together. And really, this is the first time in a long time that that effort has begun to seem as if it's having some effect. His personality is very dominant on this court. He wrote a number of these major opinions we've just been discussing, uh, and a number of them are nine to nothing in result. Mm -hmm. Now, ideologically, the court is still split, so that you have a number of these nine to nothing decisions in which five justices favor one rule, and the other five favor a very different rule. So there still are issues to be fought about, but the tone inside the court, by and large, and the atmosphere in the courtroom is radically different from what it's been for the last few terms in terms of just tension and, and personal feuds. By and large, these guys seem to be getting along and trying to do uh, the right thing as a group. It's, it's quite, I find it quite surprising. Is it the strong leadership of Justice Roberts? Well, I have to respectfully disagree with my colleague. I think the appearance of unanimity is a direct function of them taking less politicized cases this term. This is a more conventional Supreme Court docket. I suspect that in Hobby Lobby on Monday, you'll see some explosive partisan divides along the five to four lines as they revisit two of the most controversial decisions in recent memory, the Citizens United decision and the decision upholding Obamacare. So this is more or less uh, an anodyne Supreme Court docket. What you usually see, it's the last couple of years with the political footballs mm -hmm. that are the anomalies, and that's why you see uh, such divides rip bare in those sorts We're of cases. We're talking about the political, political football. Real quick here, briefly, if you want to answer this, Mr. Epps, do you think we'll see any, because this is the time of year, any uh, announcements, retirements? No. <laughs> <laughs> in a word. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Gentlemen, Garrett Epps, Mark Furnish, appreciate your time here on A Deeper Look. Thank you.